Rio Paso, welcome to Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera. My name is Dr. Kim Diaz, and I teach philosophy at the Mission del Paso campus, UPCC. And my name is Jules Simon, and I'm a philosopher who teaches and writes uh, from the University of Texas, El Paso. Today, we are very grateful to be in the presence of Dr. Gregory Papas, who teaches, who is a philosopher at Texas A&M in College Station. And I've known Dr. Papas now um, since 2004, when I went looking for him to study philosophy with somebody to study philosophy, but not just any philosophy, but to study American pragmatism as well as Latin American philosophy. So I'm really lucky that our paths crossed and we've been working together fruitfully since 2004. Yeah, and so that's, that's a little personal connection. I'm gonna do a little bit more formal of an introduction now. Um, so how, how does one begin to uh, introduce a colleague who has had such a successful career as a professional philosopher so far? Making it difficult for us to, to choose what to highlight from his many accomplishments. We, we can begin by noting how Professor Pappas has worked simultaneously in the American pragmatist and Latin American traditions, as Kim mentioned, in ethics and social political philosophy for his entire career. He has published numerous articles on the philosophies of William James, John Dewey, and Louis Piotto, and has authored the book, John Dewey's Ethics, Democracy as Experience and Pragmatism in the Americas. Pappas has been the recipient of a Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellowship, the William James and the Latin American Thought Prizes by the American Philosophical Association, and the Mellon Prize by the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy. He founded and is the editor-in-chief of the Inter-American Journal of Philosophy, which is the first online journal devoted to inter-American philosophy. Pappas was also a Fulbright Scholar for the 2012-13 academic year in Argentina, has served as the past president of the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy, and is currently one of 30-some scholars to be awarded a residential fellowship at the National Humanities Center in North Carolina for the academic year 2021-22 to, to do research and writing for his book project, Injustice, an American an inter-American and community of inquiry approach. And this is where Dr. Pops is talking to us from that place today. So thank you so much for joining us, Gregory. Um, it's so good to see you and to be able to continue working with you. Yeah, from now on, I'm gonna to refer to you as Gregory, but that was a formal do. Do. doctor do. introduction. Before you start the question, I wanna uh, thank you for this opportunity, both of you. And also uh, I wanna say uh, hello to the community of El Paso. I'm very proud of uh, what has happened um, through uh, projects such as this one and other things happening in El Paso that are really exciting. I think the world needs to know, the philosophical world for sure, needs to know that there is uh, that that there's so much great dialogue happening, philosophical dialogue happening in uh, the border. So it is a, with great pleasure and honor for me to contribute to this ongoing dialogue. So thank you. We're happy you're here. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, how would you define dialogue? What is dialogue? I think that the best way for me to. Um, to think of dialogue is to contrast it with things, other things that are similar to dialogue, that are sometimes confused with dialogue, uh, in my opinion. Um, dialogue, of course, is we, we associate it with conversation, with interaction uh, between uh, one or two people or more, um, or two or more people, I should say. But I think, I think, um, Sometimes we confuse dialogue with other forms of conversations or other forms of expression. For example, uh, debate. Uh, debate uh, is similar to dialogue, but at least my conception of debate has been, or what some people think of debate is um, 
is, is two way. So you have uh, two people, let's say, who have debate, two or more people can have debates, but it is the sort of discussion between two people in which the, there is a competitive purpose in that in debate. Like we know, there's there's debates where they decide who went who won the debate, or even the presidential debates are a good example of what I'm talking about. Also, it could be just to convince someone of some position that one has. There's something there's something about debate that falls short for me for what I think is dialogue because uh, it is a little bit, uh, the purpose is just competitive. Whereas dialogue, I think of something which requires some more reciprocity. The sort of reciprocity where we learn from each other, where there's a transformation of some sort, right? So you have a speaker and you have a listener or you have two, two speakers, two listeners, and we listen to each other. But sometimes the quality of the listening and the speaking is falls short of what I think is the ideal dialogue. So I make a distinction, and I'm not the first one to make the distinction between listening to someone and listening with someone. To me, listening with someone is a more profound sort of dialogue uh, the quality of it is, 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 is such that two people allow uh, each other to influence each other in a way there's a transformation uh, in the dialogue. There's a learn, the possibility of a learning experience, maybe I should say. So, but I'm a little torn about this, this distinction because sometimes I think that maybe, maybe what I have in mind is ideal dialogue versus actual dialogue. So I'm not I'm not totally clear on this, but I do want to say, I'll, I'll say this, that I think there's better and worse dialogue <laughs> and that in my work, what I have tried to emphasize is the importance to understand that, that precisely there's a difference in quality of dialogue and that that makes a difference in our lives. So um, you already, you did cover the first couple of questions in, in your answer. Um, understanding dialogue philosophically. And I think by, by pointing to this distinction between actual and, and ideal dialogue, um, you get at a kind of a, a kernel of um, what's going on philosophically um, in, our, in our discipline. There are theorists, there are philosophers who do ideal theory, right? And then there's others who want to roll their sleeves up and get involved and uh, engage in uh, various sorts of dialogues, mm -hmm. dialogue um, that takes getting their hands dirty, you know, it takes entering into these relationships or these relations in ways that are that are unex unexpected and we can't control, right? Mm -hmm. um, so may maybe in this at this point, maybe what you can do for us is, I know you consider what you're working on is dialogical. Right. Um, and so I don't want to this hour to go by without us talking about how you understand community of inquiry. Right. And that's dialogical. Right. Because that's been part of your work for, I don't know how long now, decade? All right. Oh, well, no, thank you. Thank you for giving the opportunity to talk a little bit about my current research. I mean, we can talk about dialogue per se, but there's, I have a personal interest, maybe I should say, on the issue. I mean, one reason I love your question is because it had make, it's making me think harder about my own project right now. Yeah. Uh, my own project right now is one of arguing for um, the importance of genuine community of inquiry that we need in our society to deal with social problems, in particular, our social injustices. And I'm trying to, part of what I'm doing is I'm trying to flesh out what do I mean by this um, community of inquiry? What, what are the key um, requirements? What, what is it that we need? And there, there, I mean, there are many things, but one of the key things is, of course, to have a genuine dialogue. 
Uh, I don't think you can separate. Uh, and here I'm following a long tradition. I'm not, not inventing something. It's not a new idea. I mean, this goes back to uh, American pragmatist philosophers. Uh, actually, you can go back to Socrates on this, <laughs> uh, which is um, uh, good thinking uh, requires good dialogue, right? So um, when I talk about communities of inquiry, implicit in what I'm talking about is um, community and, com and here's a key term, communication. Uh, and here's where dialogue fits into my, into, into the, the, normative, the normative vision that, that what I'm proposing. And a key component is there's gotta be genuine dialogue. So here I'm, I'm saying not just dialogue, but genuine dialogue. So I'm, I'm adding this kind of, I, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm, I'm uh, and I guess emphasizing what I told you earlier, which is many people have dialogues, but we should try to strive for the, the best possible optimal dialogue, which is genuine dialogue. So I need to borrow what I'm trying to do is flesh out what that is. Um, so that is where dialogue is, is, is part of uh, my project. However, I want to make clear that what I'm proposing is not this kind of simplistic view, I think, which are, some people have or simplistic naive faith, which is we just need to we just need to talk, <laughs> right? Like problems of racism. Well, we just need to talk, and it's, it's all going to be resolved. Um, so I think it's it's a lot more. Uh, it's not that simple, but I do want to stress that yeah, we need to talk. <laughs> But we need to also take care of other things happening um, uh, as we talk. That is the inequities of power relations, for example, between people when they get in the table to talk matter. Even things like the tone of your voice is going to influence the quality of the dialogue. There's so many factors. I mean, uh, communication and dialogue is quite, quite intricate factors and conditions that we need to think about. Like uh, the medium, I already mentioned the tone, right? How you talk to someone. Uh, I already mentioned, uh, let me mention a couple of more things. One of them is uh, the setting. Uh, where are we having the space? Where are we having this dialogue? <laughs> uh, we cannot just assume that we, we're just gonna, uh, that it doesn't make any difference. The other important difference is the medium itself. Like, because I do think, and this goes back to the first question you asked me, which I should have elaborated a bit more. Dialogue requires a medium. And I think we tend to overstate the importance of verbal communication. But I think there are other types of communication that are dialogical or interactions, because the key thing to dialogue for me is interaction. Or here's the term I prefer, transaction, actually. It, it's not banking transactionally. And what I mean is transaction from, uh, the, I go back to John Dewey on this, that he, that, that he thought, John Dewey philosopher, American philosopher thought that transaction is key to all of our relationships. You know? Another term is relationship, right? So, um, so I do think that the, the medium can be nonverbal, right? So I think, think of two musicians. Sorry, I'm a little, uh, you know me, I love music. So I think I always try to think of examples of music. I cannot think of a better example of ideal dialogue <laughs> than two jazz musicians. Uh, and they don't talk to each other. See, there is dialogue. There is a transaction. There is cooperation. It's not a competitive thing. Um, it, it is one of exchange. It's one of money. It's, it's one of transformation in the process as they're engaging in this. And, and that is kind of, in fact, that I, I personally think that is the ideal for me when I think of, uh, of, of dialogue. You know, so what disposition, you know, authentic disposition, you need an authentic disposition to be in dialogue. Yeah. And, and it requires the ideal is like jazz musicians who are not competitive and are having fun. Um, I mean, like, if can you, I just wanted yeah. to. But, 
Can I add to that question? Mm -hmm. I mean, a disposition presupposes some kind of formation then, right? Mm -hmm. So even a jazz musician has to have, and usually does have, pretty good command mm -hmm. of um, a classical repertoire or music that they've learned, mm -hmm. you know, to, to become a really good jazz musician. musician. So you have, you know, is there some kind of, how does disposition play mm -hmm. into this, right? And, and another question, you know, because I interrupted you. What about interruptions, right? Are interruptions <laughs> part yeah. of being in a dialogue if I'm authentically asking you, genuinely asking you, right? Or um, well, the intent, right? The tone of my interruption also matters, but. Yeah, it's yeah. we interrupt each other often. We're <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, how do you gauge that disposition for authentic dialogue, what would you recommend? Because we all, it seems like all of us want to have authentic dialogue, right? With well, not all of us, not all of us, but you and me, yeah, and, and Jules. Uh, <laughs> I mean, which is one of the challenges, right? Which is uh, you find yourself in situations in which you assume the best of people, or I do, which is this person wants to have a genuine dialogue with me to find out that there's manipulation going on. Uh, right, the person is going through the motions, and and actually one of my biggest complaints, and I have to say, is even with philosophers, I mean academic philosophers, I mean people who have PhDs, is that I go to their offices and I engage in in what I what I'm thinking is genuine dialogue, but I'm finding there's no reciprocity, there's no it's, it's a one way thing, either this person is lecturing me, <laughs> right, so there's this kind of one sided thing. Or, or, um, or is going through the motions for some manipulative um, reasons. So all those things are things that undermine things. Now, what can we do about those things? And what can we do about interruptions? By the way, interruptions happen in jazz too. Um, <laughs> and I mean, there, there's all kinds of bugs, right? There's all kinds of things that happen. But one thing, great, great, one great thing about dialogue that scares people, I have to say, is the spontaneity of it, right? Right, and, and, and let me let me and let me just say this yeah. about because you brought up the jazz musician thing, and uh, because you in dialogue, it seems like the disposition has to be being willing to get into the rhythm of a play, right? right. And in in a jazz set, you know, you've got other musicians listening to each other and preparing. The transitions from one instrument to another, one player, one interpreter. Right. Right. So, so, so that means pretty interesting stuff. Um, so you really do have to be listening with, as you pointed out. I want to answer the, the question about disposition because it fits so nicely with where you're going with this. That is, there has to be in place a certain set of dispositions, which I tend to call them democratic habits or virtues. Mm -hmm. okay, in place for there to be the kind of successful or beautiful interaction that we that we aspire to that we see in jazz musicians there has to be i i think we'll all agree here there's got to be some sort of good faith <laughs> to start with right i mean willingness to like but but that requires also openness which is a virtue in my in my list um, in my view Openness, openness, I define openness, by the way, the way uh, uh, John Dewey does, which is this kind of embodied accessibility. Uh, so it, we, we tend to as associate openness too much with a disposition of the mind, like open-mindedness. I don't think that's true. I think openness is accessibility of your entire body. I mean, if you think about jazz musician, right? You're listening. Um, so you open yourself to the other, right? And that requires a certain vulnerability, is, which is scary <laughs> to, to some people. So that requires also other dispositions, such as cooperation in a jazz setting. Um, also, um, trust. My God, that's a, that's a big one. Uh, by the way, it, I, I'm going to say this in passing, but we can go back to it if you're interested. My two models of ideal dialogue, ideal community of inquiry are not just musicians, jazz musicians, but also actual grassroots communities 
uh, such as the Zapatistas communities when they engage in assembly discussions, right? They have the same sort of, I think, quality of discourse, of, of dialogue. But let me, let me finish the disposition part because I think it's an important issue. Trust. Uh, you have to trust, think about musicians, they have to trust each other. <laughs> Uh, that this is gonna, you know, and they had to put their egos aside. That's a big one. We all want to be protagonists in dialogues, right? Don't we? Uh, we want to dominate. Like right now, I'm talking too much and I'm concerned that I'm dominating the discussion, <laughs> right? So, but this requires humility. That's a big one, humility. And the other one, which is even harder sometimes, is empathy. Uh, and I have to say, you know, taking a stamp of the other. And I have to say, all this, this are, to me, is my list of, of democratic habits, which are part of democratic virtues, which is part of democracy as a way of life, or another way to talk about this is radical democracy. So all of this is part of, uh, just to go, just to show you how all of this is part of what I'm working on right now, uh, community of inquiry and democracy, radical democracy. And, and if we do that, Gregory, if we are vulnerable, we relinquish control, we trust, we authentically are open to learning. What are the ramifications if we if we aim to be in authentic dialogue with each other? Um, I think if we um, try to do that, um, the, the, the benefits is better relationships, Better, I mean, better communication, better relationships, better learning, as you were saying, uh, transformation of us, and more importantly, transformation of our shared problems, empowerment, uh, uh, empowerment. So I think all this stuff uh, is, is all, uh, there, 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 there's a lot that hinges upon this. Uh, my, my, only, my only hesitation about this is that I don't want to sound, again, like holding this kind of overly optimistic or overly naive or naive view in which it's a matter of just good dialogue. I think we need to change structural conditions. I mean, there's good reason. Let me, let me, let me talk about the issue of trust, for example, because I think it's an important virtue or habit, things to happen in a dialogue, right? Um, how can you blame a lot of oppressed groups not trusting <laughs> Um, other people, so it's just me, or I mean, or, but I mean, think about the, the ongoing problems between police brutality and the communities that they serve. Yes, I, I, I do think that the solution, or we need to work towards a better relationship between the police and the communities they serve, right? A better dialogue. But this is not as simple as I go back to my point. This is not as simple as like let get them, let's get them in a, a room to talk. No, because. There's a history of distrust that is warranted, right? We're all, I think we're all in the same boat in the sense that we all uh, share this kind of hope that if we improve the genuine dialogue between groups, for example, this will lead to a better society, will lead to more amelioration of concrete problems, okay? An example I was bringing up is example of the uh, police and the uh, uh, police, I mean, police and communities that they serve. And I, I'm optimistic. I mean, I, I'm hopeful as much as I think you all are about that, that that needs to happen, better dialogue. But I don't want to be sound as naive as to say that it's just a matter of good dialogue because that good dialogue requires all these conditions I was telling you that, I mean, I was sharing with you, such as trust. And trust, uh, there's good reasons why those com some communities do not trust police. It has to do with the history of the particular relationship between people uh, that are in dialogue, that are supposed to be in dialogue. Okay, then let me, let me, let me intervene here because there's a, a lot of points you've been bringing up that I think it could stand a little bit more uh, closer examination, like having to do with the history of means that to get into a genuine dialogue, it presupposes a certain level of historical understanding, self-understanding, other understanding. So 
we have to learn how to teach history differently, right? Yes. yes. And another thing in some, in some remarks you said to me, um, you know, you said you have to have enough people who are not naive, mm -hmm. you know, not naive about how power operates, for instance. So we have to learn how power operates psychologically, socially, politically, right? Mm -hmm. And in the example you brought up about police, uh, police brutality and oppressed groups, um, there's you know a, a certain level of understanding about what is the function of a police state that has to be we have you know we have to understand that clear mindedly, right? Where we can get into a dialogue between police and community members, right? I want to add to that. Besides the history, you know, sometimes let alone like oppressed groups and, you know, let's just say like, even just amongst um, a father and a daughter, right? Or um, siblings or, mm -hmm. or, you know, the communication has broken down, right? Um, right? So even amongst our own family, yes, it's trust sometimes. Mm. And I'm wondering, um, so it's not like intergenerational from like, you know, but just, the, right, you know, so. Um, it doesn't have to be, right. Uh, but I, I mean, one reason I, I, I um, yeah, I think that that's great if we, if we have this discussion, if we talk, think about this, not only at the level of groups, historical groups, but I, I agree with you that even at the level of relationships between family members or friends, I, I think in both cases, uh, what we're seeking, or at least um, I aim at is, or we should aim at, maybe I should say, is a transformation of the relationship, right? And that's hard because the obstacles are historical. I mean, they're, 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 and so the question becomes, how do you, um, how do you ameliorate? I like the word amelioration because what does it mean? What is amelioration? Well, amelioration can be misunderstood, but I what I, what I mean by amelioration is, tr I mean transformation. But I don't. I I the reason I, I like the word amelioration is because you want to improve the relationship, and that keeps the aim humble enough. <laughs> uh, in other words, is the aim here should be? It's not going to happen from one day to the next. That one group is going to trust the other just like if, if there's a bad relationship between you and your sibling or something like that it's not going to happen from one day to the next uh, but if you can make some improvement they give some hope that some trans some some change had happened and maybe if we go into this kind of process because it's a long process because by the way trust is a great example because <laughs> So once you undermine the trust between two people or two groups, it, oh my God, it, it can happen like this, right? But then to gain it takes a long time, <laughs> takes a lot of effort, like takes both sides usually, I mean, to, to, to work it out, right? Now, now um, uh, so, so amelioration, improvement of dialogue is something that I think we can realistically aim at. Whereas this kind of utopic aim of like one day we're all gonna hold hands and and do kumbaya and you know and it's all gonna be nice and no because they're historic they're they're, they're 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 great atrocities for example between groups that are hard to forget and I like Jules' point by the way uh, Jules uh, your point about history is very important um, people who I mean this is where a different type of education is needed. Another, another thing to point out is that, uh, and I think this was mentioned, I think by Jules or Kim, uh, is that um, we need people who are in communities of inquiry who have different sorts of skills and sensitivities. And one of them is not to be naive about power, not to be naive about, be, acquaint, be acquainted with the history of the struggles and the history of the relationships between people who are trying to talk to each other, with each other. And so we need, we need people who, uh, in, in, my, in my manuscript, I'm working on this idea that we need different types of sensitivities. So we need people who are sensitive to, for example, how many dialogues 
get co-opted <laughs> and many dialogues get corrupted or many dialogues get manipulated. And I have to say, a lot of the grassroots communities, uh, individuals, they have that wisdom with them. They have this sensitivity. Like they can, they can smell, and I'm using the word smell like sensitivity. They can smell like this, this politician is not really asking me to have a dialogue. It's, it's, it's really what? It's really using this to hide some manipulation. So we need that. Now, let me clarify something because this can be taken to excess. <laughs> so what is a virtue can be a vice if you over, you're overly sensitive to injustices to the point where you just like every single microaggression or whatever, you jump and say, oh my God, this is, you know, so, so, so this is delicate thing of what kind of sensitivities are virtues which is are not. But I do think we need in, in a community of inquiry, this kind of diversity of different sensitivities and skills. People who are a lot more skeptical than others <laughs> about dialogue insofar as, because they have had different background experiences, right? So I, I think I, I, one reason why I think um, professors, I mean, professors, the academic world who, is, who are genuinely care about injustice should engage in a more inclusive dialogue, community of inquiry with uh, grassroots communities is because we have a lot that we can learn from each other. They have an intuitive day. When I say day, by the way, I mean the grassroots communities had to deal with injustices every day. They have an immediate wisdom and sensitivity that, that some of us lack. I mean, I, yes, we got, we got numbers and we got great skills, I have to say, theoretical skills. But sometimes we lack what they, what, you know, what they, we, we can learn from each other. So that's my hope. <laughs> but the obstacles for that community of inquiry across, you know, academic world and the non-academic world, I mean, the obstacles are so many. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about uh, drawing on grassroots community. And I know you said earlier, um, one of the, uh, one of the models you look at uh, is Socrates and Socratic dialogue, mm -hmm. but the other model is the Zapatista community. And in one of our uh, exchanges that we, we shared before our interview together, uh, you came up with a list of principles from the Zapatistas. Mm. I read through them, I'll just mention a couple of them. Obedecer y no mandar, tener y no imponar, Representar y no suplantar, convencer y no vencer, y no vencer, construir y no destruir, servir y no servirse, bajar y no subir. And these are the ones you sent me, right? But yeah. at the heart of this, because it gets to a question that we ask later, but I'll ask it now, you know, yeah. at the heart of that, those principles are ethical distinctions. So in dialogue, the question was, what, what role does ethics play in dialogue, right? Do you think there's an ethics of dialogue? And clearly by your example that you said, <laughs> you know, it seems like that must be one of the, you know, uh, no, I, I, bedrock, I, I, bedrock parts of your, what you're developing and your, your idea about an ideal dialogue or an ideal community of inquiry, it has to have this axis of ethics somehow at the heart of it. Yes, uh, thank you for that because I, 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 you're right. I mean, this is, I mean, the more I think about it, uh, the more um, ethics, it be, I mean, one, one interesting thing that I'm discovering, discovering, yeah, that I'm writing about right now as, as we speak is that these three communities, because there's three communities in my manuscript that I'm working on that are my models, right? Uh, one of them is a Zapatista community. One of them is Casa Pueblo in, in Puerto Rico. And the other one is the Grace uh, Lee Box Center, the Grace, the Box Center, sorry, in Detroit. And they all overlap in sharing this kind of uh, uh, virtues. I mean, this kind of, and they have a strong ethical standpoint. And you gave a good example of the Zapatistas, right? They have these principles, right? Um, so they have a moral backbone to them in their, in their but, it, but it is not ethics in the, maybe the way philosophers think about, right? It's not like rules, right? These are big principles 
that they they, they present and they use in their for education purposes, but they, it, it's, it, it's, it's a way of summarizing their everyday practices and what they aspire to, right? Now, one interesting thing about, about this, and this goes, I think, with what you're trying to stress here, is they don't want to separate something that we philosophers, I think, or many philosophers, as you say, uh, I'm finding out, separate the politics from the ethics, mm. right? Um, they're very explicit about this very explicit, which is you cannot separate <laughs> proper politics from ethics. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, what they're doing, they, they don't understand that separation. We're, but we, and I mean we, many academics who write, I have to say about Zapatista, I'll give you a good example. I have read articles in which they go on and on about the politics of, uh, of the Zapatistas, which they have it, they have a politics, okay? but they don't mention their moral commitments <laughs> uh, as if that was not central. And they are very clear that what their, their, what their commitments are moral, okay? And, and, and one more thing to, to your question, I'm trying to uh, stress the, eth the political and the ethical component of my own prescription of, of my own stands on community of inquiries, right? But I'm trying to be careful not to, the basis of that normative commitment, I wanna ground it empirically, so to speak, in the very uh, grassroots uh, communities that we're, I'm talking about. In other words, I'm not der deriving this prescriptions from some uh, bell of ignorance, goes back to ideal theory that you started the questioning, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not starting, I'm not starting from a bell of ignorance or some elaborate theoretical thing. I want to say, no, 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 no. Uh, here's concrete communities who have moral commitments, which I happen to share, believe. I mean, the, the basis is not this kind of theoretical show of exercise that is associated, or abstract theoretical exercise that's associated with ethics. So. Yeah. So, but the yeah. ethical component is, is very important. And I, I'm glad you mentioned com, uh, the particular principle of Zapatistas, convencer y no vencer. Because this, doesn't that get to the core of what I said earlier about the distinction between debate and dialogue? Right. Right. I mean, nice. uh, it's not about debate. It's, it's not about um, convince. I'm sorry. It's not about vencer. It's about convincing. <laughs> so you want to convince someone and when you engage in that, you don't want to, it's not a matter, see, it's a matter of trying to uh, have the sort of optimal dialogue. And I'm sure some, something else I love about this community, is that if I must, um, is they're very aware of, of, of the fact that they're not perfect, meaning they're very aware of the fact that dialogue sometimes doesn't work. <laughs> They're very aware of the precariousness of things. I mean, they're very aware. I love that. They're very, they're very fallible about things. And, and here's the great thing. They want to learn from their mistakes. They're not dogmatic. <laughs> I mean, it, once I started, by the way, once I started to do some research on them, I was like, wait a minute. I mean, we need to start with them. We need to, we need to like, we, I mean, we, is, I have to, like I, I totally changed the the order of my manuscript. <laughs> I, uh, my first chapter is talking about these three communities, and from there I take off into philosophy, <laughs> because I think they have they have the philosophical wisdom there already. So my job is just to like pick, like try to clarify, try to like contribute, do my own philosophical contribution to what they. And by the way, talking about dialogue, this has to do with your previous question uh, that I didn't quite answer fully. And that is the question of, is your word dialogical? Mm -hmm. um, I'm very excited about my work right now because I am actually having a dialogue with members of these communities. Mm -hmm. So it's not just me uh, here in the National Humanities Center, which I love the center, but uh, having dialogue with, I am, every time I go now to the island, Puerto, I'm from Puerto Rico, um, there's this community called Casa Pueblo. And two, two of the um, 
leaders of the community, in particular, the, the, uh, the most important one, Alexis Massol, I am having an exchange with him. I mean, I'm having a genuine dialogue, which is for me so precious. And it all started because I went to his, um, to the place, to the communities one day and just say, look, I am just a philosophy professor and I'm working on a book and I want Casa Pueblo to be in it. And he, we sit down and we talk for three hours, for three hours. And I left that place like, oh my God, what just happened? And here's the thing. After that, we follow up after during the, the worst times of the pandemic. Can you believe it? He, I, I emailed him and I said, look, Alexis, I'm working on this book. I have a chapter. I have a chapter where I talk about Casa Pueblo, what you're all doing there. But I don't want to talk for you. Remember my distinction about listening, for, you know, talking with and talking, you know, I don't want to talk for you. I don't want to publish a book in which I say what Cabo Pueblo is doing. I want to run it by you. So I sent him a chapter of uh, where I talk about Casa Pueblo and I couldn't believe it. He replies and said, let's talk over the phone. So over the phone, he, read, he actually read the manuscript and he gave me tips about what, you know, I mean, he liked what I did. Start with that, which for me was like everything. But he was telling me, let's fine tune it. Let's say this and this. And I did it. And, and to finish the, I'm sorry, I'm taking long, but I'm excited about this, obviously. Um, the, uh, but just happened, I just came from, back from Puerto Rico and I uh, visited again, Alexis and what he, did, what he did for me was incredible. He gave me a chapter on his a manuscript that he's writing about his life in the community there in Casa Pueblo. He wants me to, he wants me to read it, to prove, you know, to, to give him suggestions. So for me, this is the ultimate because not only I'm trying, you know, like I am actually doing what I think a little bit. I wish I could do more of this kind of thing, which is engage the actual communities that I talk about. And the other one was a, a, a community from Detroit. Yeah, I mentioned that, but I didn't quite catch the community. Yeah, this is, this is an interesting community. Uh, it's the uh, uh, Buck Center in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, the reason it's called Buck Center is because uh, in memory oh, Grace, of- uh, Grace Box. Grace, Grace Lee Box, right. Yeah, I, yeah I, I met those folks. We had- Or Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy and Grace, yeah. Uh-huh. You met those folks, awesome. Oh, that's a great community. Oh, I, I, I again, I went there, I visited there and uh, they welcomed me and I had some dialogue, not as significant as I had with Casa Pueblo, but yeah, it's a great place. By the way, let me let me say this, since we're talking about dialogue and, and since it sounds like you both share a little bit of my hope here, <laughs> um, and we need hope nowadays. <laughs> um, Something that I'm finding out in my research, because I'm going outside of the academy, uh, is there is all over the United States, in spite of all the horrible things happening, <laughs> there's actually a lot of grassroots communities of different types, just like the great, the box center, that are actually doing incredible, fantastic, radical democracy work. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make the news. And I'm upset about that, it doesn't make the news because I think if people were to find out, and let, let me, well, the best example, I mean, another example is close to home, El Paso, right? I mean, there's a lot going on in El Paso, including what you're doing there. For me, for me, that's part of radical democracy, what you're all doing. This, what's happening right here, right now, is part of radical democracy. We agree totally, but I think it's interesting. So let me just point this one, we only have a few minutes left and we want you to ask questions of us, but. The three communities you chose are all um, in larger communities that are really struggling. You know, the, they're, they're really struggling politically and socially, you know, in, in Southern Mexico and uh, Puerto Rico and Detroit. And those are like kernels of hope or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if you're thinking about your, your community of inquiry in this way, but, you know, it's kind of like if you, you seed them with enough 
um, publicity or strengthen them by bringing more attention to them. Perhaps, you know, it'll be like yeast in a bread, you know, it'll start rising. And, well, yeah, you know, yeah. Yes. bite out of it, right? <laughs> No, uh, uh, I see. I think I understand your point, uh, but let me clarify something because something else that I have learned through paying attention to what they have to say is that they have. There's a sense in which they do have. They themselves have the kind of aspiration you're talking about. Uh -huh. um, but it's interesting how they the, the, the type of aspiration they have. They don't have. They don't have the type of aspiration of, in fact, one, they have a, I, I go into this in one chapter about, they have a new notion of revolution. Uh, they don't believe in revolution in the traditional sense. They're critical of the traditional uh, sense of revolution of um, we're gonna get, we're gonna make coalitions and we're gonna grow and there'll be one class who is going to take over the earth. I mean, it is kind of like, or that there's a final salvation to all this and the whole world is going to be uh, right. Or even at the level of Puerto Rico, even at the level of Mexico, they don't have that. It's interesting. Their concern is so locally grounded, <laughs> which is we want transformation, my, my term, amelioration, right here, right now in the local, the most local uh, community, right? Now, we want to extend this as far as we possibly can, but not with the aim of transformation of the entire Mexico or entire Puerto Rico. What we want is what we, what we help, what we want and we aspire and we work towards is helping other similar local groups. So it is movements that are all uh, locally based that their, their, their aim is local transformation, even though they're globally minded in the sense that they want to have this kind of network where they support each other. But they really understand that my problems here are not the same thing as your problems there. Mm -hmm. So you need to deal with your own problem. I have to deal with mine, but we need to have a, a network in which we, we support each other uh, in, 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 in many ways. And we have seen that the Zapatistas have done great things uh, across across the globe, but it is supportive of other similar local groups in the process of radical democracy. There is no hope for a big revolution at the level of the of the, and and the, and the aims are much more humble, right? They don't have this revolution as this kind of end of the road global salvation. There's no global salvation. <laughs> There's just local amelioration. That's it. Do you have questions for us? What do you, uh, anything that, you know, we try to make it more dialogical than just peppering you with questions, so. <laughs> uh, maybe you can tell me about similar um, radical democracy grassroots groups happening in El Paso that you know that I don't know about, but um, uh, what's happening, I know that, uh, you have had, in a way, what I call communities of inquiry, you know, pass through this uh, philosophy um, uh, groups, right? Or, or club of philosophy, right? Right, so I guess what I could do is like send our viewers to episode number one. Um, okay. Yeah, you know, put in the link right here, click here. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, yeah, uh, the one with uh, Dr. Juan Ferret and the Philosophic Dialogues. I know, and you have you have been involved in many many projects. Well, maybe not many, but yeah, a couple that are significant. So I would say minimally, please watch our episodes for the one with Dr. Juan Ferret and also with uh, Professor Gomez and her philosophy club. Those are two. Um, if you'd like to know more about yeah. this question, and I want to ask you one more question, Gregory. About sure. We spoke about a lot about being in dialogue with others. What about being in dialogue with ourselves? Is that possible? I feel my philosophical view about dialogue is grounded on the ideas about the importance of dialogue of such thinkers that something, I mean, like George Herbert Mead, for example, that you know about George Herbert Mead and John Dewey and others. 
um, and actually other Latin American philosophers who had thought that dialogue is central to um, thinking, right? So they have the view uh, that dialogue, when we, when, we, when we think with ourselves, individual, as you were saying, individual thinking, um, even if I don't talk to anyone, when I think uh, what I'm doing is having internalizing a dialogue. You have it when you think you have like a conversation, an internal conversation. You take different standpoints. So you think, uh, like I don't know you, but sometimes I think about there's there's a little there's a there's a good Gregory and there's a bad Gregory and they're having a discussion, right? <laughs> you know, I'm caricaturing, but but there is like different cells that you internalize in this kind of dialogical process. So I think thinking itself is, is actually dialogical. I will go further. I think um, we as selves, as, as selves, we are dialogical. That is, we're having, there, there's a dialogue between myself today and different self, which is the self I was. So the self is in constant formation and is dialogical. I also want to say, that even nature itself is dialogical. And what I mean by that is it's a dialogical process. Think about, um, think about the ecosystem. It's, it's a system in which different beings are in constant dialogue, trying to reproduce some sort of balance. So I think dialogue is key to even nature. Yeah, and, and we can come back to music theory and counterpoint. counterpoint dialogue. Absolutely. Yeah, that's also a dialogical play uh, in in, in uh, music compositions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Gregory. It's so special that you you know made the time to be here with us. We really thank you, and thank you too to our viewers for joining us today. This is Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera. I have enjoyed this dialogue. <laughs> thank you so much. And we have too. Thank you. Join us next time.